the question today really is that how do we look at technology and culture and it's uh, it's almost a similar kind of questions that comes up of how we look at technology and science in fact a lot of the scientists think of technology as something really uh, that enables to do serious work but that's really by itself not serious and i suspect a lot of the cultural uh, creators of uh, great works also have a similar relationship to technology think it's important but it's really something that others should do while they consider the really serious stuff of making culture now i think technology has various implications for culture and as we go on we will try and look at all some of them and i think the most important part of it is also it creates a whole range of new questions that every time you have a technological advance of a certain kind and certainly we live in times where we do see such advances that it poses new questions of or a cutting across a set of issues one of them i'm cause discussing here of course is simply of ownership that you have technology today which allows it to appear that we can create far more than we could in the past that everybody is talking about at the same time we see that really a few very important companies if you will multinational corporations if you will today control the ownership of what is being produced its ability to reach people that is being controlled in different ways we may think for instance that youtube is really democratizing a cert in a certain way it is true it does but at the same time youtube also becomes the dominant channel tomorrow that how you it will works of art will reach us and therefore if we look at the ecosystem of culture today where a number of people survive on say a newspaper a magazine various other forms all of that tomorrow may be just google youtube and facebook google in fact owns uh, youtube today so you have the situation that if you look at the ecosystem of culture which is television which is magazines which is uh, various other things radio if you will all of that can tomorrow migrate almost entirely to the internet and it is possible that becomes a dominant channel of access and therefore if it does so then you have the situation that how do others then survive if there is only one television channel called youtube then how will others survive now maybe people say it's good we don't really need the others looking at some of the television programs i also seem to you know i would might think so but the question is that it really poses a issue vis-a-vis -vis languages countries groups and so on so this is an issue of ownership which technology creates then of course what is the content of culture content of culture for a lot of us would be culture of resistance we write we speak we perform because you want to change society that's the purpose with which a lot of people will say that's why they are in doing what they are but if ownership becomes then concentrated in a few hands then you might get the culture of conformity as a dominant mode and that is of course what we see today that you can protest on various things but provided that protest is understood to be within certain bounds now that allows protest it also makes protest conforming in a certain way but if you really challenge something more fundamental then you could be just wished out of the space you don't get access to people you don't get access to channels of communication your uh, stuff may not be printed in the newspapers and so on and so forth so ownership of course also creates a problem of how do you really then have a culture of resistance which can change society fundamentally so these are not some things which are new but the point is if we look at the power with which media is enlarging its sphere then all this become even more important that today if we look at the newspapers or you look at television channels you will have the same actors going to various studios saying the same thing so you have this 100 channels supposedly providing a variety but the variety is restricted almost to saying the same thing 
even the controversies, the same controversies will be on the channel. So you have this homogeneity in spite of the fact that technology has supposedly created this entire heterogeneity of, of, of topics in space. Now, my take on this, I'm going to leave uh, some of these issues to others. My take on this is that if I look at culture, that there is the culture in terms of its content, what it says. There is also culture as an artifact. It could be a book, it could be a CD, and nowadays it could be just something you download as a file from the internet. So you have different kinds of artifacts, which artifacts which are there. And I look at, in a slightly narrower sense, that if I look at, not as its content, for which there are much better speakers over here, and uh, I will look at culture as simply what happens when you produce these artifacts, when you reproduce the artifacts. So, <coughs> And also, if you really look at it, also distribute this artifact. So you have this, essentially, this part of culture, which is how do you produce them, how do you reproduce them. And I think the reproduction has been the one which people have looked at the most. So this is what I was saying, that I, we can look at technology in all this, and how then it impinges on what we are creating. <coughs> now, I'm not going to go into this audience to talk about the mechanical reproduction, if you really look at mechanical reproduction, it starts with probably the printing press. That's probably the first major advance you see. Before that, when you create a work, an oral work, if you will, our epics are all that, then every time you produce a copy, it's really also transcreating an original work. Because every time you speak the same piece, you might make changes to it. If somebody else speaks it, as long as it is oral, every time he or she speaks it, it's also going to change. So there is really no difference at that stage to my mind of what is the original and the copy because that there is no reproduction in that sense. Every instance of the delivery of such a piece of work means changes to the work. So they are, each instances are really also instances of, instances of creation. So was it Homer? Was it Vedar Vyas? Were, were they really people? It's really an open question and I'm not even, th I'm not sure it makes an enormous amount of sense to go into it. But when you come to written work, then you have, when you get parchment, when you get papyrus, people start writing, then there is a copy. There's an original and there is a copy. But even every time there is a copy, because it's being done by hand, there are changes. So copying is therefore leading to changes. I will not call it transmission loss, because it really could be adding, it could be making it better, could be making it worse, could be just different. So you have the issue of then every copy of the book that is produced, maybe by a great thinker, Somebody else who comes into it inserts his or her own contributions to it because there is no concept at that time of really of authorship in this strong sense we see today. And in fact, putting your original work into somebody else's more well-known uh, person, in fact, would help to promote that work. And you're interested in promotion of your ideas. And authorship in that sense was not so important. When you come to mechanical reproduction, when you start printing press, and that's obviously a huge change. I also like the idea that the wine press is what lead, really leads to the printing press. You know, I'm not going to comment on that further. But uh, the, the point is, when you start bringing different technologies together, you have paper, you have the ink that is there, you have the type forms that are formed. All this leads finally to the printing press. And with the printing press, of course, the number of the production of books go really up. One must also not forget that it's quite interesting, technology which is inherently what we would see today as democratizing can also be very oppressive in the short term sense because the Bible was the first book to be produced, I'll not comment on that, but the second book to be produced was what is known as the Hammer of the Witches and that was the second largest uh, dis distributed book at that time and it was used in the Inquisition to find out what the witches, what the witches were doing and all of them confessed to what the hammer of the witches prescribed as what the witches do. So the devil's semen was cold and so on and so forth. And all of them confessed to what are the described as what the witches would do. And this was the standard text of the Inquisition. So printing press actually did contribute in a large measure to the witch hunts that took place and 
essentially a number of women who are uh, m midwives and so on being persecuted and killed. So it's not just like, you know, you have the textile machinery which comes in and you get immediately uh, slavery in the United States because suddenly you need much more cotton. So let's not look at technology which essentially is liberating, what we might think as liberating, democratizing, also has this characteristic when it starts. It quite often man manifests itself in its opposite before you see the larger potential that, that, that takes place. Now, one thing that happens is, of course, mechanical reproduction that we are talking about, it comes into tel with films, with music, with radio, with television. You, of course, expand the scope of re mechanical reproduction enormously. You have a master, you have a copy, and of course you can display it in radio, you can show it in television, and so on. And you get what I would call as broadcasting, for which actually print is the first one, because you're printing books, it's in some form broadcasting. But of course, television and radio are far more clear. Now, the, the part that I think is important today, and that I think is that when you look at it, uh, is that you also today are looking at the internet where you have a different form of communication. I'll come to that very quickly. But what does printing really do as, as I say, as artifacts? That you know how much, how it transforms the production is that, as it says here, it, a monastery was the primary creator of books in those days. Of course, it does get into Italy into more uh, organized form later. But it's, it really could produce number of books, it could produce very few, because it had to be, each had to be transcribed by hand. It talk, took a scribe about a year to write a book. And, you know, Reading Abbey, one of the major leading producers of books in that, st in that stage in England, took about, in 80 years, produced 300 books, 300 copies, really. When you come to printing press, of course, you have a huge quantum jump that takes place, 9 million in 50 years. So you can see the quality, quantity increasing, but it's also important what happens to cost. Now, if you really look at the monastic mode of production, which is the Reading Abbey, for instance, so one person produces four books in this, mo uh, one book in a year. When you go to the manufacturing mode, you get all the scribes together, you put them, so one person does the ruling, one person does the illustration, somebody does the writing, then you get about to four books per person. That's what you get in a year. And therefore, the books were very expensive, apart the fact that you used vellum and so on, but also the sheer labor that went into it made them very expensive. So rough, roughly a book would cost about 1,500 pounds in today's terms, if you look at the cost of a book at that time, and therefore very few people could afford it. So the literacy was not important because you're not likely to have that kind of money. In fact, in many um, earlier time, medieval times, the books were counted as a part of the pillage. If you, you, when you robbed, uh, you went and robbed somebody, uh, some kingdom, then when you toted up all the things that you had dropped, among the things books would be counted as something very valuable and they would be entered as also part of the booty. So of course then we come to the issue of the property. What happens when you have this technological revolution which creates a mass market? Of course then you get a concept of authorship, ownership, all these issues come up. Who owns the book? By the way, the printing, the publishing or the printing industry originally claimed they held the rights to all the, all the, not the author. In fact, the copyright was giving the author back the right. And in fact, when it gave this right for 14 years, the printers went again and said, well, after 14 years, it belongs to us because they were a guild. And they said, all right to print is only to us, with us. So in fact, copyright liberates it from the printer and gives it to the author, the right to sell copies. This doesn't mean authorship. Authorship is of course inalienable, but the right to the right to reproduction, the copyright, the right to copy, is that is what's been given away as a copyright. And that becomes alienable. It can then be sold and bought on the market. And of course you have the publishing industry which comes, liberates it, gives the author some rights, but as of course as we know today, really the publishing industry today decides who is the star and who is not and so on and so forth. Of course, not that it, the, the consumers don't have any role on this, but certainly publishing industry also creates a whole range of new stars and what should or shouldn't be uh, popular. Now you have of course the 
what is called the copyright extension of the United States. It's now 95 years, and this is really called, uh, called by a lot of people as the Mickey Mouse Act. Whenever the copyright of Mickey Mouse Disney expires, or is about to expire, the United States Congress extends it. From 70 years now, it has become 95 years. So that's why it's called, it's also called the Mickey Mouse Act. In India, it should be called the Rabindranath Tagore Act, because it was 50 years earlier, because of Bishop Bharati and the Bengalis believing that Rabindranath should belong to Bishop Bharati for another 10 years. They extend it to 60 years. And it, they wanted again to extend it to 70 years, at which time people said enough, you know. So that, 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 is, that is the history of the copyright in India. So, of course, now the question comes up that, okay, we have this concept of authorship which technology has <coughs> demarcated as author and owner of the right to copy. So you have these different forms that are now created. Now you have, uh, of course, the issue of what we are confronting as software industry. That software industry has created uh, a concept of what is called the new public license. I'll just take one minute for it. It's basically what would be called a viral license. That means if I, my source code, what I've written is open, anybody can use it under the li new public license, but if you use it, you can give it to anybody you want, it is free, you can give it to anybody, you can modify it, no issues, but you have to give it under the same license. That means if I give it to somebody, he can't alienate it and say, now it's become my private property. So new public license is really a viral license in that sense, that it infects everything, and that's good, because you would like software industry, monopoly rights of the software industry to be taken out. Now, I'm not going to go into this issue today because, you know, where, uh, why the software industry by and large is following the free and open source model today and why the industry is moving away from what is the called the proprietary model. But what is important it is it's created this concept of different forms of license and copyright within the copyright framework itself. And uh, Lawrence, of course, is a very important part of that, which is called the Creative Commons license, which gives a different kinds of rights to cop. Some authors may say, you can take my work and modify it. I know that most authors will not like that. They're very jealous. They don't want their authorship to be dis destroyed in this particular way. But they say, if you want to use it for non-commercial purposes, please go ahead and do it. It's free. Uh, but if you want to change it, acknowledge that you have changed it. This is the original. This is a change you have made. So there are different levels of Creative Commons licenses, which started from the new public license, but also accepted that unlike software, where authorship really nobody cares about, Bill Gates didn't write any code uh, that I know of, which is important. But authorship is not important, but ownership was. In the case of creative work, authorship is important. And therefore, Creative Commons take to care of that to create different forms of uh, ownership, if you will, of the copyright and what you could do with it and what you could not. So maintain the content of authorship at the same time allow dissemination in a different way if you want. And I would think for all those authors who are sitting here whose books are no longer available, it might be a good way to say, well, take the rights back, give it away as creative com com commons and put it on the net is a way of distributing. At least people will get to read it. Otherwise, we can't even read what Alok uh, might have written and now is no longer, uh, maybe copies are not available. So now, you see, the difference of that technology today is creating is that you had a master from which you copied. This is the mechanical reproduction age. Today, copies are made on your PC. Every time you download, you use it, you're really making a copy. Now, what does this copying do is, of course, it's perfect copy. That's the advantage of a digital copy. There is, unlike mechanical reproduction, copies to copies had transmission loss. This doesn't. It's as good as the original one. That's the advantage. And that's why the problem that the music industry and the film industry claims. Because earlier, any copy they could say was not as good as the original. Now it is. And therefore, they have the problem with copies. Now, the problem that that is there is that if you take this copying, as a user, I, if I have a book, I can give it to my friend. I can sell it, resell it, and Amazon you can buy a used copy, for instance. But if I take a digital copy of what is with other, otherwise called the DRM, the DRM issue that is there now, that what is called digital rights management by those who would like to restrict it, and a lot of others will call it digital restriction management. What it happens is when you give a digital copy 
of say an ebook which you buy on the net then it's restricted in different ways you can make that many number of copies for your own use you can't give it to somebody you cannot resale it so now we are getting into areas of also not only of authorship now we are also getting it what do we own when we own a copy so if i buy a copy of an ebook i buy a music which i download from the net i also now have different levels of restrictions put on me so i don't in the full sense own the copy which i did under laws which allowed a book or a music cd to be given to me and then i own that copy i could give it to a friend i could lend it to somebody i could resell it i could take it back and give it to the shop and say hey this is, i do, i don't like it i change it for something else all those things are now gone so you get into a situation where what is ownership in terms of the ownership of a copy is also not clear today and becomes a bone of contention now i would submit in all this what we are talking about is technology creates new issues it creates new issues in terms of legal rights it creates new legal forms and that is a terrain of struggle so when we as people who are talking about technologies of different kinds restrictions of different kinds are talking about is also connected intimately to the struggle of authors for their copyright authors to get reach their uh, audience all of this must be seen together it's not just something which is a struggle of technology versus ownership it's not a struggle of authors versus publishers but it's a larger struggle of how really we uh, have the digital potential of democratization of reaching knowledge to the people reaching creative things arts to the uh, works to the people how we manage that that is a terrain of struggle today on which the technologists the consumers and the artists have to work together thank you